Hey everyone, how's it going? Everyone enjoying B sides? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jen Fox. We're going to talk about the Moscow Rules. <coughs> a little bit about me. Um, professionally, over the years, everything that I've done has been a. Oh, nice. What? Yeah, thanks. For, yeah, thanks, HP. Um, has been some version or, or other of doing translations. So translating between the, the business and the technology, between uh, information security and information technology, between stakeholders and, uh, and project people. And it's been a, a vital and consistent skill throughout. These are my office assistants in their, in their usual sort of helpful spot. The, the, the tabby cat, she's a cat sore too. She's destroyed at least one machine and several presentations. So she's the one to watch out for. Uh, this is, I, I really love uh, Detroit graffiti for one. And this is actually, um, I don't know who the writer is on these, but these uh, Detroit Tigers are all over town and I just really liked them and wanted to share them. I love canning. It's one of my favorite life skills, as is uh, lock picking. Who's been to the Locksport Village? All right. Who's, uh, who, who tried the competition? All right. Someone did. And um, so, so love picking, love collecting. And you never know when a good life skill is going to come in handy, right? Yeah, for something anyway. So anyway, we're here to talk about the Moscow Rules. How many of you have heard about the Moscow Rules or heard of them before? Not too many people. So this is a set of rules that is said to have been used during the Cold War by Western agents operating in, in the East, specifically in Moscow. And these were things that they would do to uh, keep their, their lives and their missions safe so that they could do, do what they needed to do. This is a set of 10 rules. If you do a little research, you'll see lists of up to 40. But this is a, a good base set. And when I first saw these at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., which is a really interesting place, um, I saw this on a poster and realized this is what I do when I'm at consulting engagements. This is like my standard operating procedure. So, so now we'll talk about it. Uh, the name was, uh, of the presentation was about achieving detente to secure the enterprise. And detente, for those of you who you know, weren't around in the 80s, uh, it's, it's a slackening of tensions or an easing of tensions. And that's important because, like these guys, these old timey guys, um, they're, they're busy tugging in opposite directions, and so they're going nowhere. And so you don't have to necessarily uh, get along completely. It doesn't have to be about kumbaya necessarily. But when you're doing this, you can't, you can't get stuff done. And like, for, for those of you who were, in, who were in Ben 10's talk this morning, it takes all of us. All of us need to be able to work together in order to secure stuff and to secure our enterprises and our information and, and our users. So we'll take a, a run through the, the rules, and then we'll look at a case study. So, yeah, we all think what we know. Grum we all we all think we know what Grumpy Cat's all about, right? Um, ask questions. Learn to ask questions about things. It's very easy to jump to conclusions. Uh, pay pay attention to what what your instincts are telling you about a situation. And if you're not very good, not everybody feels comfortable with their level of uh, instinct on reading people, learn more about body language to get a sense for whether something is going well or not. And you can, you can adjust. This one, I would argue it should be phrased, everyone is under opposition control. When you look at it from the perspective of other people's goals. We all have goals, things we're trying to achieve. So 
we're trying to do things to get our project done. Uh, maybe you're trying to implement some new, new controls or uh, new things in a department somewhere. The people in that department also have goals and it's to get their job done. And anything that they get measured on for their next evaluation, they don't want to have that screwed with. And if the thing you're trying to put in place screws with their ability to get their next raise, you're going to, you're, you're going to be a, in a deadlock. How many of you have had that sort of occasion where you're, you're talking, maybe you're talking about someone to have that moment when you stop and say, they're behind me, aren't they? Right? Lots of us. Yeah, it happens. It's awkward. <laughs> so this is about that and also about just con consulting manners. I mean, if, especially if you're doing consulting, you're at a client site, maybe you just talk to someone you think is a complete idiot. It happens. Uh, save your comments for when you're, you're not right there. You don't know if the person, the other person in the elevator is the, the idiot's uh, best friend, golf partner, they go to the same church, you have no idea. And it, got, and it goes back, it gets back around fast. So Prince Charles may have had his own reasons for not, not wanting to blend in. I mean, there's times when you don't, right? Uh, but it pays when you're trying to build bridges to learn about uh, culture, pay attention to the culture of a place or the, the jargon, especially for those of us that do consulting. So maybe you go into a business uh, briefly, fairly briefly, and uh, it, they, have, they have their own lingo for, for different things they do. So it's important if you're trying to gather information and develop that, that rapport to learn more about their language and their culture. How many of you either do pen testing or have competed in a capture the flag? So, a few people. When you're getting ready to, to do that, how many scans do you expect to do? One? More than one? And once you've done your scans and you're ready to, to try to do exploits, do you just say, yep, SQL injection and I'm going to be done? Or you've got, you're, you've got a bunch of tools in your toolkit, right? So same when you're dealing with people, have more than one way to deal with them. This is the, the overlap with social engineering. While the talk is not principally about social engineering, the Moscow rules definitely have an overlap. And developing rapport is uh, one of the, the best things you can do to kind of get things, get things going. Pets are like the best social engineers ever. And sometimes it's tempting to engage negatively. You want to use that only on special occasions. Okay, sometimes baiting people works to uh, get certain types of information out or break something loose, but it shouldn't be the, maybe your first approach. Especially if your goal is to build some bridges, build relationships, because uh, you, may, you may need to have those in place later. So time and place for, for action, everything has its time and place. Uh, this one, it also relates to, to this one. You want to be able to be able to go back and talk to people again later. So, so do a good job. The, uh, this one, probably the, the story that I like best about this is how many of you have been in a meeting, like a staff meeting or something, and you've got the, the boss and a bunch of bosses in the room with their, their other people, all, everyone all down the ranks, and they say, who feels comfortable here that they can go to, go to their boss and talk to them? <laughs> you <do. laughs> Two of you do. <laughs> Most of you don't. Most people in the room aren't going to, if, you, if that's the information you want, that may not be the time and place to ask it if you want a, an honest answer from people. Miller's Law, this is George Miller. Uh, cognitive psychologist, and Miller's Law is one of my 
favorite things I've learned of recently. It's a close adjunct to assume nothing. In order to understand what someone is telling you, you have to first accept that what they're telling you is the complete truth, and then ask yourself, what is it true of? How many times have, have you gone to someone and said, hey, I need you guys to make this coding change? Hey, hey, Mr. Developer, can you just write this script? And they say, I can't do that. What, what might that mean? How, what's a way that you could interpret that? I, can't. I, I don't know how. I can't do it now. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, not for you. It's it's against policy. You, ha you haven't followed proper channels. Okay, we have really really uh, robust uh, change uh, change management processes here, and this is outside that that channel. We know that's never the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, so I don't, know, I don't know how, and I don't want to admit it. There's a lot of different things that could mean. How many of you have had, either been on a, a consulting engagement, or you've had a boss ask you to put together, do some research, put together some recommendations, you do that, you give it to them, and they do something completely completely else. They do whatever they were going to do anyway and it had nothing to do with your recommendations. How many of you had that happen? Lots, right? And how many of you at some point or another when that happened felt really insulted and irritated and felt like why did, why did they even bother asking if they weren't even going to take my advice? Okay? It's really easy to go there. And that's, ego suspension gives us an alternative to, to that. So this is Heather and Doug, and they have three weeks to go into an organization and look at how protected health information flows through it, uh, who touches it, and, and what generally what's, what's going on with it. So the first thing they do is they meet with their project sponsor. And they ask them the, the usual few questions. It, why, why do you need to do this project? And he said, well, we need to comply with fill in whatever, you know, whatever the, the most recent thing is, the final omnibus rule, or CMS is coming, or o o OCR is coming. So that's, the, that's kind of the usual thing. And you, Mr. Sponsor, complete this question, uh, or this sentence. Uh, I'll consider this project to be successful if it's on time. And, and if I find out about anything that might potentially blow up so I can fix it before it's a breach or something that's very expensive or embarrassing for us. So that's a, a, certainly a good outcome for him. And since this guy's from the compliance department, they ask him what kind of a relationship, since we're going to be out here representing you or saying that you're the one who sent us, what kind of relationship do, do you think that you have with the rest of the organization? And he kind of pauses for a while and says, yeah, I think we have a pretty good relationship with the rest of the company. What is it true of? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So what is, the, what is that true of? What might it be true of? Disagree. Disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe he, maybe he actually does think he has a good relationship. Maybe he knows he doesn't. But he doesn't really want to get into that with the consultants who just walked in the door. He doesn't want to like taint them with any of any of his baggage. Or maybe he wants to be able to identify that through a process and we can uncover it in that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Is it better to maybe phrase it a little different, maybe say, you know, we're gonna be going to other people and talk to you and what, what do you think they might say? Because that way it's not Mm -hmm. And so far, 
all we know is this one, we only have this one data point. And it really, one point, it's not, it's, a, it's, a, it's just that, it's a point. So maybe we can add it to other things, other data points we're gonna collect and see a pattern later. But so far, it's like, it's just sort of an interesting thing. We can't really assume anything one way or the other. It could have meant a lot of things. So before Heather and Doug dive into actually talking to people and going out and asking questions, they're gonna take some time and they're gonna do their research. They're gonna do, uh, review any documentation that their sponsor has already provided for them. So they can be a little bit more familiar with the departments, what the, the company thinks it does, what it, what it thinks it, that it knows. Uh, they're also gonna do a little open source intelligence gathering they're going to look at what kind of jargon, if they can discern that. They're also going to set up some questions in advance because they want to be really deliberate and really think about what they're, what they're asking and what they're trying to retrieve and gather. So this is the set of base questions. So they're, they're gonna have a set of questions. They're gonna ask everybody. And they're also going to have some specialized questions for different job functions. This, these last two, what kinds of things make your job easier, what kinds of things make your job difficult, are variants of the pair of questions I've been using for years. And these don't always seem like they're necessarily going to, to yield information. They seem like random questions really unrelated, what does this have to do with protected health information? Who cares, who cares what makes the, the customer service rep's job easier? But from a rapport building perspective, when you start asking people, what do you like best about your job? What do you, what do you like best about doing customer service? Um, what's best for you about processing claims or you know, working with patients? Then they start, they start talking and they see that you're listening, and they start talking more. And then when you get around to, what do you like least about your job? What part of your job could disappear tomorrow and, and you'd never miss it? The floodgates open. They tell you all kinds of things, much of which will not be in your report. <laughs> but you've built some, some really good rapport at this point, and they're, and they're willing to, to talk, and they're feeling more like, they have a relationship with you. So understanding as you go in, uh, any, of the, any of the jargon that you could pick up helps so that as they're talking about what they do, you're not interrupting them to ask them, what, is that, what does that word mean? What does it mean when you say that? Also understanding the department objectives. So going back to the idea of what do people get evaluated on? What are the metrics that they're going to be measured against? Because that's what they're going to care about. It's what they're, they're going to either get um, pra praised or punished based on whether they meet or don't meet that stuff. And that's, um, again, echoing Ben Ten's talk, they're more, much more interested in that than they are ever going to be in compliance or following uh, information security process or procedures. And they care about whether they're going to get a raise this year. And when you're really prepared, yeah? Uh huh. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, also, by doing a lot of prep work in advance, you can be more efficient in your time with people and be respectful of the fact that you're taking uh, them away from whatever it is they're actually being paid to do. And, and then perhaps when you need to go back for clarifications, you're, you're welcome to do so because you didn't take 
too much advantage of their time. So all right, they're ready to go. Their sponsor has set up a kickoff meeting with the department managers. So the managers know what's going on, they know about the project, they know to expect you, and they get the, the grumpy manager who says, yeah, so you're the third set of people to come in here and ask about what my department does. Uh, how many people have been on that project? It is not a great way to start. So instead of being yeah, the, oh, consultants, they're here to help us. You're, you're, you are now branded as one more set of consultants who's going to come in here and waste my time and give us absolutely nothing and waste the company's money. Uh, <laughs> so all they can do at this point is just promise that they can be sympathetic. You know, we're sorry, that sounds really, really frustrating. We, we understand. We, will, we promise to be as efficient as we can with your staff's time. And so that was not really the place to get into uh, engaging negatively, even though it might be tempting or it might be a reflexive action when you have somebody who's being really contentious. Uh, fact is, Heather and Doug need the cooperation of those managers in order to get their project done and in order to deliver something of value for their client. So here he is. Guess who their first meeting's with? This guy. So he's waiting. He's at the threshold of his office. He's waiting right there in the door. Here, look, I've got two binders. This has everything you guys need. You don't need to talk to my staff. He, I even dusted the binders off for you. So, so they thank him they, and say, we're, wow, thank you. I bet this is a lot of really good information. We really appreciate this. And we still really need to talk to your people. That's real. That's our our project. So he says, "All right, fine. I'll be ready for your visit." So, do you think a grumpy manager is that is that about Heather and Doug? Is that the attitude? Does that have anything to do with them? No, he's got stuff to do. People have been through his department three times. Um, what else might it be true of? So he's got, he's got his, his big binders of everything you need to know about my department. What, that, what might that be, be true of? Maybe. Maybe. He might, he might feel like he's got some really good documentation. <laughs> he might. Mm -hmm. And B, he just put a lot of effort into putting that documentation together for you to be protective of his staff's time. Right. And that may very well be his interpretation of how he has really been wrong. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is the way on paper we say we do it. I don't want it to come to light that that's not the way I do it. <laughs> Which makes it good information how we say we do it. We, we want to know that for sure. I may have additional information that I need after reviewing this, and that's how I keep the door open that I'm going to still ask some questions, even <laughs> though you handed me all this. Right, right. So it could be really good documentation. That could actually be the truth. You know, maybe he just doesn't want people rummaging through his department. That's very likely, too. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Always. More documentation. <laughs> more, more documentation. Three weeks to the month, this year. Yeah, so. Documentation. <laughs> Liz? I wonder if the grumpy manager part of that is I would sit there and take the time to look at the documentation that I, you know, the staff can do this on their own. I'm probably pretty excited about it. He might be really proud of it.
-hmm. Yes. So now they actually get to go talk to some of the staff. And one of the things that, that I've learned over the years is maybe 50% of the time the staff actually know you're coming. Good half, the half of the time you show up and they say, and you say, hey, hi, I'm here to ask you some questions about, about what you do. And then this is who they think you are, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so then, then how, how much information do you think they're gonna feel comfortable giving you if that's who they think you are? <laughs> so, 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 always leading with you know, making sure that they know who you are and what you're what you're there for helps, and asking them if they have any questions so that they can, if there's something that's on the person's mind that you can clear up before you start asking some questions, it can really go a long way for setting people at ease. And they go through, they ask the prep questions. And these last two, these two quotes are real quotes from me using, especially the, what do you like best and what do you like least about your job? And it, when somebody says, I feel like I'm being interviewed for a magazine, what level of information do you think you're getting from someone like that? <laughs> Good, right? I mean, somebody says, wow, someone's actually, they're asking me questions, they're paying attention. And that doesn't happen to a lot of people, and especially at, at staff level positions, unfortunately, or no one has ever asked me that before. Um, I and think you might have gotten the opposite effect too, because if I feel like I'm being interviewed for a magazine, to me that means that whatever I'm saying is public record. Oh. And my boss <laughs> We are not going to tell them that so and so said this, and we show them there's no place on the piece of paper for your name. I usually do lead with that. It, it actually that I tend to I don't I don't attribute quotes to to sources. Something a project like this usually part of the deliverable is going to be here's a list of the people I the the, the individuals that I talked to so that they know who you, who you got gathered information from, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you even have to change it because if you don't have enough people, we don't want to put the best quotes because we could be using cheat patterns it's or whatever carry through and they'll know, oh, I know who said that. Yes. I, I did have a manager one time demand that I tell them who you said. I've had that too. And I, I stand fast yeah. on, on that one um, also. Actually, in this, in this case, this was someone who was just really happy that so, again, someone was paying attention and taking interest in in them and what they thought about and what they what they cared about. Unlike these guys. <laughs> so, uh, assume nothing is really really big with this one. Even though the manager said, "Sure, they're going to know you'll that they'll know all about this." Oh, really? Don't assume that. Uh, and if they think you're the Bobs. They're, they're not going to give you the level of information you probably need to, to do your job. So working on the, the rapport building helps a lot in that circumstance. So uh, to, to Liz's point earlier, they find out that some of manager one's staff process the same information three times manually. And there's a lot of undocumented exceptions to the, the process. Uh, they're not too surprised, but manager one might be that they're, those things are not in his binder. So they've seen some things, uh, they've, they've heard quite a few things, they've seen some things that impressed them, they've seen some things uh, that have not impressed them, but they wait until they're out of the client's sight, they wait till they're back at their home base or wherever, you know, not where there's other people, before they start making their commentary about whether they thought that he was, he was an idiot or whatever. Uh, because you really don't know, uh, you don't even know if you're having dinner afterwards and kind of debriefing, you don't know if the people in the booth next to you know it's a really small world. 
and it doesn't doesn't take much that that somebody else who was on who's on the PTA with his wife or you have no idea so they wait and that's the don't look back you are you're never alone so now they, they're developing some confidence in their process and they're rolling through all their staff interviews it's going beautifully and now they're going to go talk to somebody who's a subject matter expert who is put forth as this is the person you really need to talk about talk to about what goes on in our in our case rooms um, she know she knows it all and to to facilitate i just scheduled a meeting for you guys with her in the conference room does anyone can anyone even think of and what might be an issue with having having these kinds of meetings in conference rooms Hmm? Oh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's one. Mm hmm Yep, partially. Um, that it, they're, they're out of their own, their own context. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, it won't make any difference at all. For other people, it can seem intimidating. So there's two of them. There's one of her. She's being called into a conference room. What is this really about? Yeah, I know you said that. This isn't about, you said you're not the Bobs. Um, and so they start, they go through their, their, their routine, they do their little who's on first thing, and now they're asking her, hey, tell us what you like best about your job, and they're getting nothing, nothing at all. So what, it's not working, what do they do? She is clearly, physically, she's clearly really intimidated. By the, by the whole thing. So they try to dial it down a little bit, step back, they get, try to do some little self-effacing things, try to say, wow, we know this can be really intimidating, uh, sometimes it's hard to remember things. They're still just getting nowhere. So they've got, they just, they've got to cut bait at this point. They're not gonna get anything more. They still are gracious and thank, thank her for her information, for her time, and hey, can we, do you think we could come and observe you in a couple days in the, in the case room on, on surgery day? And so, and, uh, and, and she says, sure. So having a variety of techniques, in this case, it still didn't help them. In many cases, it, it may have, yeah, dial, dialing it down or trying a different approach might have gotten, gotten things going. In this case, it still just didn't. And it was clearly just, <laughs> they weren't she's supposed to be an expert we're obviously getting nothing we need to to uh just stop for for today so a couple days later they go to the, the case room where everyone relate, who's going to work on an operation uh goes beforehand to get all the information about the the case they see the medical records uh the the x-rays all the stuff and they're watching and she's like a totally different person. She is clearly in command. She is in control of this room and all the information and people are really looking to her to know what they need to do, who they're, who they're working on, what, which, which of the, all the doors that, uh, that they need to, to go through to, to go to the right place and have the right person. And uh, so when there's a, a lull in the, the, the action, Heather and Doug ask her questions, and now she can tell them all kinds of things. And partly they, because they can point to, hey, you know, on that monitor, what is that? What's, go, what's, what's going on in the monitor up in, in the corner? And then she can tell them, hey, when you handed them, when they were asking questions about the, you know, that folder you handed them, what is that? And she can tell them all, all about that. So even though she seemed like they'd, she'd been billed as an SME, the first time they met her, she was really kind of withdrawn and mousy and uh, did, just didn't seem to have an awful lot of expertise. It seemed like she didn't know much of anything based on her answers. Uh, being on your, your home turf and actually having uh, access to the things that you use can uh, it really helps people it jog their memories. It makes them more comfortable to, to talk about what they're doing. 
Plus, if you're really looking at how a process works and you're working with people who really are uh, SMEs, they're, they're really expert in what they do, so much stuff uh, is just the equivalent of muscle memory. They don't even think about a lot of the little details because they've done the things so many times that it's stuff that would have gotten glossed over in a simple, hey, tell me what the steps are to your process. There's a ton of stuff they don't even think about anymore because they know it so well. So your mission, should you choose, choose to accept it, is assume nothing or at least work on it. That's one that takes a lot of practice. Work on figuring out uh, markers or hallmarks of what other people's goals are or what other people care about and see how you can make uh, whatever you're trying to do kind of dovetail or support what they're, uh, what's important to them and what they're trying to do. Uh, look at your, your, the culture and the environment. Sometimes you want to blend in, sometimes you don't, but choose. Yeah, make, uh, yeah, choose, choose that yourself. Expand your skill set. Uh, some of the recommended reading here is from a lot of different disciplines. Uh, I understand that uh, the Confidential book by John Nolan is out of print now, but if you can find a used copy, it's, it's a very good book. Um, there's uh, Robin Dreek's book is really good. Any of you who went to Chris Hadnagy's social engineering class this week, uh, that's one of the, the, the books that you guys looked at. Uh, this is actually a, a sociology book about the qualitative interview studies and um, body language. There's actually a lot of really good books about body language and books from other disciplines. Uh, information security is a relatively young discipline, and, but we have a lot of overlap skill set wise in um, other professions that have been around for a really long time, the first, the, the first text for, for law enforcement and military personnel, there's generations of knowledge in that field. Uh, sociology, generations of knowledge about how, how people work and interact. Uh, same with psychology. So thinking, thinking um, outside of stuff that's strictly information security and uh, Look, look at what other disciplines might have an, an analog to the kind of thing you're trying to do. And those are the rules again. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Thanks for your time, everyone. And you didn't even have to time me out. <laughs> that went fast.